So what I want to do in this video is have a look at the entire first chapter of the America making of a superpower module and explore really the issues of the era of reconstruction and the subsequent Gilded Age. So 1865 to 1890, this should be a particularly long video. And we'll go through everything, we'll go sort of touch on as much as we possibly can and later on in the year we'll do more detailed videos but just to get the content out as quickly as possible we're going to do these uh, larger uh, full chapter videos um, for now so what we're going to look at in this video is the weakness of the federal government we're going to look at the politics of the gilded age we're going to look at the sort of social regional and ethnic divisions during the gilded age the economic growth and prosperity agriculture and laissez-faire government we're also going to talk about the impact of ending of the frontier and we're going to talk about isolationism and then finally we'll look at tensions with other nations specifically tensions over canada so as an introduction it's important to talk about the events leading up to the era of reconstruction and really to talk about the structure of the u.s government because if we understand those things then we can understand reconstruction and the gilded age the gilded age a lot better so the American Civil War ended in April 1865 with the surrender of the Southern forces, the Confederacy. And the Civil War had cost the lives of nearly a million people, 625,000 people, and a cost of around six billion. Okay, so it was a very, very expensive war. And it's the war that I believe it's the uh, most costly war in terms of lives that uh, America has ever been a part of. The Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated around the same time, just after uh, just after the, the ending of the Civil War. He was assassinated uh, in a theatre by uh, John Wilkes Booth. His successor, Andrew Johnson, was a Democrat. OK, so this is just sort of setting the scene for really what happened uh, and how the Reconstruction plays out. So the U.S. government is under, organized under a written constitution. This is just looking at the structure of government. So we have they have a written constitution. It's a constitution that's all written down in one place. Uh, in law, you would call it a codified constitution. The constitution outlines the roles and powers of the branches of government. Okay, so the government is made up of the federal government, the, the government that. Um, the government of the nation, not individual state governments, but the federal government, is made up of the executive, who, uh, you know, effectively the president. Uh, it's also made up of the legislature, which is Congress, and it's also made up of the judiciary, which is the Supreme Court. And all of these have different powers to uh, check and balance each other out, okay? So the, the idea is that the no one branch gains more power over any of the others. They have different roles and they have different powers and they can check each other's powers. That's how the US Constitution uh, works. So let's start by looking at Johnson and the form of Reconstruction. Okay, so Reconstruction involved really two key issues. It was really how far should southern states be punished for seceding from the Union and how African Americans, uh, mainly former slaves, should be treated in the southern states. Okay, Johnson wanted to see states return to the Union as quickly and as smoothly as possible. He did not want to punish the South, and he felt that each state should be responsible for how it uh, treated its African American population. Uh, most members of Congress were opposed to this view, since they were mostly Republican, so they were of the opposite party. Many were radical Republicans who wished to see harsh punishments taken against the southern states for seceding against the Union. So there was a bit of a, a there's a bit of a conflict already building between Johnson and Congress. Congressional victory over Johnson is the next part we should look at here. Okay, so Congress rejected Johnson's plans and passed a Civil Rights Act. Johnson did veto this. Veto was one of the powers that Johnson had to um, to check the uh, to check Congress. He has the power. The president has the power to veto any legislation that they want. However, in return, Congress can override the veto if it gets enough votes, and so Congress did override this veto in April 1866. 
So this Civil Rights Act later became the 14th Amendment, uh, giving African American, uh, all African Americans uh, born in the USA citizenship and full rights in law. So in November 1866, uh, the Republicans gained a huge majority in the Houses of Congress. This was a, against um, the sort of view of Johnson. And this gave them the power to impeach uh, Johnson, which was also another power that they, the Congress has over the president. And Johnson only survived this impeachment process by one vote. And in 1868, the presidential term ended with the victory of Republican President and former Union General Ulysses S. Grant. And this is really, really where it ends, the, the presidential reign ends for Johnson. But Grant wasn't particularly uh, much better when it comes to Reconstruction. He opted for a form of radical Reconstruction. So Congress passed four separate Reconstruction Acts and placed the southern states under military rule. Most historians regard this radical Reconstruction as a failure. Most of African Americans were voted into political office, but they were poorly educated and thus lacked any political experience. Uh, the entry of uh, carpet baggers and scallywags <laughs> into the political and economic spheres was deeply unpopular within uh, Southern whites. So within the Southern white states, the idea of these people becoming uh, becoming uh, members of, of of the political sphere, going into the political the political realm this was seen as a deeply unpopular idea uh, many white people embarked on a policy of terror to intimidate african americans into withdrawing from the political process and the most notable was the formation of the ku klux klan the kkk in 1866 another white group called the redeemers also attacked uh, attacked corruption in government so we can see all of these problems coming from this era of radical uh, reconstruction. We also have the idea that in uh, by the 1870s, many of the North were tired of radical reconstruction. So not just the South uh, didn't want reconstruction, but also the North as well. As a result, uh, the 1876 election was contested. The Compromise of 1877 led Democrats to support a Republican candidate this was rutherford hayes if reconstruction was to end so we have a, a situation where a compromise had to be made between supporting a candidate of a different party in return for the ending of reconstruction so let's move on to now we've looked at really how reconstruction played out following the uh, end of the american civil war let's have a look now at the politics of the gilded age so the politics of the gilded age really was seen as the era of weak presidents. The Gilded Age is the name given to around 30 years after Reconstruction, which really marked a period of weak government and uh, a lot of political corruption. The period of 1866 to 1896 saw a period dominated by congressional government where presidents tended to be weak and relatively ineffectual. And even in that even within that it was the house of the senate which was the most powerful of the of of the two houses of congress at this period in time so that's why we see that the house of representatives generally was seen as uh, disorderly and indecisive so real power sit within the senate and we can look at the presidents of the gilded age the presidents of the gilded age included grant then Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, and Cleveland again. Okay, so these are the presidents of the Gilded Age, known as the weak presidents, the era of the weak presidents. When it comes to looking at political corruption, one could start by having a look at the reform to the civil service. Reforming the civil service became a very big issue uh, during uh, the Gilded Age. So the role of the federal government due to the increased population and settlement in the West. And the federal government's employees grew from 53,000 in 1871 to 265,000 by 1900. So you can see that the civil service, the growth of the civil service was, was quite um, phenomenal. In 
and there was a lot of corruption within the civil service we'll look at the political corruption specifically in the next slide but civil the civil service was relatively corrupt uh, politicians were able to control uh, specific appointments and grant people uh, in return for political favors so people weren't being you know promoted on merit they were being promoted on you know through um, political um, favors reformers called for a more efficient and less corrupt civil service this is what was really important okay and this but this reform wasn't really effective until 1883 we see people calling for this um, reform of the civil service, but we don't really see many people sort of playing out this uh, this reform. It wasn't until uh, James Garfield, the president, was assassinated by an angry uh, applicant for a public office, that people started to see uh, this wanted to started to see people wanting reform. So they were he was assassinated in 1881, and then by 1883, effective civil service reform began to began to come through when it comes to political corruption uh, it was, must be said that political corruption was rife there was a series of scandals that brought this into light the sort of the idea of political corruption within the government so in september 1869 a group of speculators tried to gain control of the gold market and they did this fraudulently uh, grant appointed also appointed uh, corrupt officials into high office his includes the private secretary, his secretary of war, and these were these people were involved in what became known as the whiskey ring scandal in eighteen seventy five, and this was a scandal which would defraud the taxpayers. So as you can see, we are starting to see you start to see political corruption through the lens of these specific um, these specific events that these effectively fraudulent events that occurred okay city governments were also associated with corruption you have new york is a compelling example with the tweed ring amassing millions of dollars before being broken up in 1873 so these are just some examples of the of the the kind of rife political corruption that we see in this period now we're going to move on We've looked at the government. We're going to look at the sort of social, uh, regional and ethnic divisions that we see in the USA after the Civil War. So there is divisions between uh, the North, South and West, effectively. Okay, So the North became increasingly industrial and urban. So there was an urbanisation of the North. It was uh, resented by many elsewhere as dominating the shape of US political and economic development. So they were seen as the ones that had all the real power in politics. And it was felt that the politicians represented the views of the North a little bit too much. The views of the South and the views of the West weren't really represented in the federal government as much during this time. So the era of Reconstruction made... Uh, after the era of Reconstruction, some made mention of a new South, which was modernising and embracing new technologies, a rebuilding of the South, effectively. So, for example, the creation of railroads became a big part of this new South uh, myth, this new South idea, this new South identity. New industries like coal mining grew in places like West Virginia, and a new steel industry became uh, prominent in places like Alabama. And we have people like, uh, you know, entrepreneurs revolutionising uh, the tobacco industry with the use of machinery. And the example of this is machines that were able to create 100,000 cigarettes a day. So the sort of production, economic production, was uh, would, grow, would grow almost exponentially with the growth of um, using use of machineries in this period. And despite all these developments, uh, most of the South did remain rural and focused on agriculture. So there were some developments in the South when it comes to industry like coal mining and the tobacco industry. However, for the most part, the South did remain rural and agricultural. The development of the West has always been a feature of American history, almost a feature of American culture. And we'll look about the frontier a little bit later on. In the final uh, one quarter of the 1800s, a third of the population of California and Nevada were foreign-born citizens. And many in the West resented uh, 
the federal government. They thought it was a bit too far away. They valued what they call rugged individualism. Okay, so the idea that the government, this federal government from you know that's hundreds, thousands of miles away, um, is controlling what they can do in their life, they were not very keen on this idea, and they valued, like I said, this rugged individualism. Following the Civil War, the development of uh, cattle industry led to huge ranches uh, feeding in the growing population in the of the eastern cities. So this was in the west. And most people moved west to farm mainly because of the 1862 Homestead Act. This act allowed 160 acres free to those who could farm it for five years. So it really did give incentives for people to move and settle in these new lands. So farmers in the south uh, and the west did face huge problems of debt, however. Markets were also unstable, so if the market collapses, this could cause more issues for farmers. So this idea of the Homestead Act being some kind of, you know, eternally positive uh, piece of legislation isn't exactly true because there were still problems of debt when it comes to uh, people settling in the West. When we look at the position of African Americans, we can see that they still face discrimination throughout the USA. This would be the case all the way effectively to the to the present day. Okay. Southern states increasingly passed Jim Crow legislation to ensure that the the black community and the white community would remain segregated. And the idea of political disenfranchisement was a big issue as well. The idea of, you know, preventing them from preventing people from voting based off uh, the color of their skin. Voter suppression was done by a number of issues, by a number of things. So there were literacy tests, so people could only vote if they passed these certain literacy tests. Obviously, people would assume that uh, African Americans were not able to pass these literacy tests since they had lived as slaves during and before the Civil War. You also have what were known as grandfather clauses. They stipulated that only those whose grandfathers had been able to vote could vote. This would also stifle the uh, and disenfranchise the African American community, since the grandfather, since their grandfathers were most likely slaves, and therefore could not vote. And apart from voter disenfranchisement, you also have terror and intimidation. There was a growing number of lynchings during this time, uh, due to the work of groups like the KKK. And then finally, there was also a great migration, which was the sort of move to the north uh, of African Americans where life was a little bit easier. It was a little bit easier to live. Okay, This became difficult for southern states because they wanted to maintain their supply of cheap labour. And if the, ch the supply of cheap labour, formerly slave labour, um, was moving up north in the Great uh, Migration, this sort of left them with a, a, a kind of catch-22 where they were trying to suppress their vote but at the same time, they still wanted them to remain where they were so they could keep their cheap labour. When it comes to economic developments, we're going to look at a number of different issues. We're going to look at expansion of industry. We're going to look at railroads, oil, steel and the rise of corporations. So let's start by looking at industrial expansion. So industrial development took place for a number of reasons. The first reason, there was improved communications and in particular, the development of the railroads made it possible to exploit natural resources. The USA was growing uh, through westward expansion and massive migration. So the growth of the USA was just increasing faster and faster at this point. And there was an optimism which encouraged risk taking and entrepreneurship within American culture. And then finally, successful industrialists like uh, Andrew Carnage and J.P. Morgan were far more celebrated as role models than politicians. So these people were seen as the role models in American culture rather than the presidents and the politicians at the time. When it comes to railroads, railroads saw huge growth in the years following the Civil War. So 40,000 miles of track were laid between 1830 and 1870 and 100,000 miles in the following 20 years. So you can see as an example of the railroad production, hundreds of thousands of miles of rail track were built 
The first transcontinental railway was completed in 1869, and by 1900 there were four more transcontinental railways being built. While the railroads, the railroads were private companies, their growth was facilitated by massive land grants from the federal government. So we're starting to see the government in, uh, creating incentive for people to expand and for industrial and uh, you know industrial and economic growth to really just take shape. And railroads led to the introduction of what became known as the the sort of four time zones across the USA. In 1883 this was the case and they were really indirectly responsible for the development of the transcontinental telegraph system. So really we looked at the idea that the railroads were very very popular and very very important and were a positive part of uh, American economic development. But the railroads did have their problems. Railroad owners could be corrupt. Most often, they were corrupt. Uh, with huge, with a huge sum necessary for railroad construction, finance was often unstable and difficult to, um, you know, properly secure. During the period of economic depression between 1873 and 1879, it also came about that the 25% of railroads would fail during this this even the slight depression in uh, in economic development so the railroads weren't 100% positive however they did have their positive aspects and they did have a number of negative negatives uh, attributed to them when it comes to the growth of oil industries we start to see development coming from the standard oil company of cleveland which was founded by john d rockefeller in 1870. This was the most successful oil firm. It would embrace modern technologies and ruthless business practices to ensure that by 1879 it controlled 97% of oil industry in the USA and this would make it almost a regular monopoly. They would have a monopoly on the oil business. When it comes to steel, the uh, steel was dominated by Andrew Carnage the steel mills in Pittsburgh uh, were responsible for 70% of the nation's output by the 1890s. And much of it went to the production of more railroads. So you can see the, the sort of cross, uh, the sort of substitute goods for different um, industries. The steel industry would prop up the railroad industry, for example. And, isn't it, and in this, we've talked briefly about the sort of rise of corporations. If we look at the, you know, the, the Cleveland, the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland and the companies by Andrew Carnage. And really, the rise of corporations was a very important part of the Gilded Age in terms of its economic development. When Andrew Carnage sold his steel company in 1801 to J.P. Morgan, U.S. Steel became the first billion dollar corporation. And the growth of giant corporations has always was had been a feature of U.S. industrial development, in which one country company sorry controlled all the productive processes of the manufacture of their product. And so, by 1904, the largest four percent of U.S. companies were responsible for 57 percent of total output, total production, and. As an example of this, General Electricity controlled 85% of the nation's output by the turn of the century. So we're starting to see the growth of monopolies and oligopolies, um, making it difficult for competition to grow. So you're starting to we're starting to see that a lot of these industries were monopolized or oligopolized by these huge corporations. By the way, if we just get a, a little bit of um, you know technical know-how, a monopoly, if a corporation has a monopoly on an industry, it means they control 100% of their output or, or close to 100% of the output. So, for example, if a Ford were to buy up every single car company and make every single car in the world, they would have a monopoly over the car industry. Oligopolies are a little bit different there, where not just one company owns all of the output in an industry, but where, you know, multiple companies, but still like, you know, the 
top four or five companies own um, all the output in an industry. So, for example, for example, when it comes to UK, sorry, to the world's um, phone production, for example, things like Apple and Samsung, and there are only a very a small handful of phone companies in the world. So, therefore, they have collectively an oligopoly over those over the phone industry. So you can sort of see why this is a problem because it makes competition difficult. It makes people uh, because people haven't got any real kind of choice in how where they go to get their uh, in you know where they go for whatever um, products they want to buy. When it comes to development in agriculture, we start to see that agriculture was thriving. So the development of railroads saw farming uh, regions. Uh, able to transport their produce to the growing urban areas in the north and even beyond. Uh, so as an example, between 1870 and 1900, the number of farms doubled to 5.7 million and wheat production was increased to 600 million just between that small period of time. The number of cattle had risen to 68 million. However, it could be said that there were many problems okay so many farmers were constantly in debt harvests and markets were unstable and generally farmers had to borrow unexpected incomes from the harvest moving on to more problems there was no real central banking system so local banking institutions could charge high interest rates often between ridiculous interest rates between 10 and 40% so to make more money back than they would loan. And as a result, by 1900, as many as a third of all farmers became tenants. This did lead to agricultural protest. So many farmers were joined together in uh, cooperatives. So from the 1870s, many farmers joined together in cooperatives, working together to try and eliminate the middlemen and gain control of the sort of purchase of goods and the supply of the markets. By the 1890s, these cooperatives had grown into the National Farmers' Alliance, which would then morph into the People's or the Populists' Party. So we can see that the backlash from the exploitation of the agricultural community led to almost the unionisation of the agricultural community through agricultural protest. When it comes to urbanisation, there was a lot of movement into the cities. So there was considerable um, amount of movement from people who wanted to seek work in the urban areas. So as an example of this, the population of Chicago grew from 30,000 to a million in 50 years, between 1850 and 1900. The population of New York had gone from a million in 1860 to three and a half million by 1900. And this, on the face of it, shows that the cities had great promise. Okay, so Prima Fasci, cities showed great promise. By the 1890s, skyscrapers were being built uh, with as many as 25, uh, as big as 25 stories. Okay, so we start to see the the growth of these huge um, skyscrapers by the end of the 1800s. By 1902. There were uh, 66 of these being built in Lower Manhattan alone. And just like with the agricultural industry, there were still also problems with the with the urbanization of uh, America. OK, so many lived in poverty and in overcrowded conditions. This sort of growth in population in places like Chicago and New York wasn't wasn't the city wasn't really able to sort of cope with this amount of people growing and so it didn't grow uh, as a result political corruption was still being encouraged through a patronage system so the sort of favor for favor and the kind of sort of promoting people not based on merit and so we can see that political corruption still showed uh, was still was a big problem within the within the federal government and this was seen mostly through the urbanization when it comes to economic policy moving on now we can look at the laissez-faire government 
so the idea of a laissez-faire government as a laissez-faire system so as an introduction a policy of laissez-faire was sort of implemented between 1865 and 1890 so this meant that the government would take a very distant very hands-off approach to um, intervening in people's lives effectively most provisions such as social services and education were the responsibility of individual states and thus were highly variable so they would vary from state to state uh, the federal government did very little to conduct for other than conducting foreign affairs uh, and diplomacy so when it came to domestic policies very little was done during this period very hands-off this Gilded Age has been known as a period of weak governments as we mentioned earlier on so Hayes believed that Congress should be responsible for solving the nation's problems and not the president and an example of Hayes being very hands-off when it comes to domestic policy he was concerned with the civil service reform and the treatment of African Americans however he believed that just raising these issues to the, the federal government was enough and was his job well done he didn't see the need to intervene any further and therefore he did not initiate any legislation uh, moreover president arthur urged congress to reduce tariffs but little again was done to pursue uh, pursue this issue he simply he raised this issue he thought that the government should maybe do a little bit about it but his job was done just by raising the issue despite this though we do have examples of the federal government getting involved in domestic policy from time to time during this period so for example under the harrison administration which was between 89 and 93 congress spent uh is that a billion a billion on various spending programs so one of these were a rise in tariffs to an all-time high this were culminated in the mckinley tariff of 1890 you also see the passage of antitrust legislation which we'll talk about later on and we also see committing the government to buying through the silver purchase act of 1890 of about four and a half million ounces of silver each month to produce more money in circulation to just create this sort of quantitative easing when it comes to more legislation congress responded to the deep unpopularity of trusts some significant legislation was therefore passed this includes the interstate commerce act of 1887 this act uh, said that all railroad charges should be fair and set up uh, an interstate commerce commission uh, to supervise the uh, railroad charges railroads were made to publish their rates uh, so they had been overcharging small scale firms and offering rebates to larger ones so you can see that they were favoring the larger firms over the smaller firms well the internet commerce act tried to eliminate this issue okay so while the government was not able to set the rates themselves this piece of legislation did mark a sea change and an important break from uh, this sort of laissez-faire government so we can also look at the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and any trust it basically stipulated that any trust restricted trade between states or the USA and foreign nations was declared to be illegal it appeared to be an impressive piece of legislation however only on the surface really if you look deeper down you can see that um, a lot of the terms of the act were made deliberately vague so that they could be interpreted so there was this interpretative element and the act was also weakened by a supreme court ruling this is very important so the court ruled that the american sugar company had not violated the law by taking over a number of competitors so they declared that the law was not broken despite the fact that the american uh, sugar company controlled 98 percent of all sugar output so we can see that the trust the antitrust act designed to try and break up these huge monopolies and these huge industries was stifled almost by the supreme court by not by by allowing the um the sh the american sugar company to control 98 percent of the sugar industry that's problematic uh, 
When it comes to sort of cultural changes, we have to look at the closure of the frontier. So as an introduction, Western expansion and uh, so and the uh, sorry, Western expansion of the and the settlements of the frontier uh, had long held significant resonance in the USA. That's a little bit that's some poor typing there. So in the early 1890s, two developments suggested that the frontier was now closed. OK, so that we had, the expansion had ended. This was the 1890 U.S. Census Bureau Declaration. And in 1890, the U.S. Census Bureau declared that the West was now fully settled and there was no longer any more of a frontier. For the first time, there was no undeveloped land available in the United States. And there was also the 1893 Turner thesis. And F.W. Turner was an academic historian in 1893. He wrote a conference paper called the significant the significance of the frontier in american history okay and had a wide influence on at both the time and was much debated ever since talking about the idea of the closing of this frontier turner argued that the idea of the frontier had been of deep significance in the development of the usa so the availability of free land acted uh, acted as a safety valve against social disharmony, is what he argued. And the, also the difficulty of settlement led to self-reliance and independence among Americans. So it's definitely said that during this Gilded Age, the frontier closed. There was no more, uh, there was no more unsettled land in the West. So really, what was the significance to Americans of this uh, of this ending of the frontier? Well, first of all, it must be said that the Census Bureau and the Turner thesis were very conclusive in their view, but there were still areas that were unoccupied. Also, life on the frontier had been so harsh at times that some decided that they wanted to return back east. So this sort of this sort of you know. Uh, westward expansion the you know the manifest destiny the western expansion that um we see in american culture wasn't entirely the the it wasn't really the whole story you've also got issues of people not particularly liking the the westward expansion and returning back to the east so um vast cattle ranches for example were developed in the years following the civil war this was a quite a significant part of the of the frontier and uh, the extension of railroads made long drives less necessary while particularly harsh winters in 1885 and 1887 killed as many as 90 of the cattle so the great plains became largely an area of farms so as we expanded west the more agricultural development uh, came as a result so some large-scale farms had the ability to afford new technologies and improve efficiency. So with the development of westward expansion, you also see the development of new industries. And farms that are so big are able to uh, use new technologies to improve their efficiency. Some also suggest, some historians also argue that the idea of the frontier was more of a myth. Okay, this is the idea that the US had always needed new areas to settle and to civilize and so a, a myth would was deeply resonated in American culture and American history and this myth enhanced uh, was enhanced by popular entertainment ideas of the West being the so-called Wild West and there were also popular novels and later movies which would celebrate war against Native Americans so really we can talk about how the ending of the frontier in the gilded age sort of led to the expansion of imperialism across the seas in the usa because they couldn't they couldn't uh, settle and expand it anymore in the west they looked towards different areas and started to build this sort of um, american empire so we'll look at this uh, later on when it comes to American foreign policy, we have to talk about the issue of isolationism. So as an introduction, in the 19th century, the US seemed to be detached from foreign affairs. 
this was what's known as the policy of isolationism and there's a few reasons for this and we'll talk about these reasons in a little minute so there were a number of reasons why the usa was able to avoid foreign affairs and they really had the motivation to afford to avoid any kind of foreign policy for one the us was geographically far away from the great powers of europe they were across the ocean it was all so therefore easy for them to avoid issue of international politics the birth of the usa was also relatively unique a unique factor in the way they um, acted in foreign policy the fact that the usa emerged from rebellion against an imperial power meant that they had no intention to be involved with such powers so they didn't really want to be involved in trade policies for example with uh, the british empire we also have what is known as the monroe doctrine which was um, issued by james monroe who was a president in 1823 so quite a long time before the history we're talking about now um, this doctrine warned european powers against involvement in the affairs on the american continent so the application of this was mainly um, because of the wars of independence in latin america and against the likes of spain we could also see the application of the monroe doctrine in the french involvement uh, in 1866 the french involvement of in mexico which we'll talk about now so during the american civil war the french established a puppet emperor maximilian in mexico uh, and supported him with french forces with french troops and this led to a rebellion by mexican forces and then following the end of the civil war after the u.s was um you know was was not occupied by their own by their own strife uh, u.s secretary of state william h seward demanded that the french withdraw from the continent and this resulted in the moving of five thousand troops along the mexican border and so we can see that this is the uh, application of the Monroe Doctrine in on the US continent, okay? And as a result, the French did capitulate and withdraw. So we see, yeah, like we see it, it's an application of the Monroe Doctrine. However, it must be said that during the Gilded Age, uh, the Monroe Doctrine wasn't applied consistently. And an example of this would be that the USA didn't prevent Britain from acquiring colonies in uh, British uh, uh, Honduras, for example, and in 1831 and in 1832. So we start to see that they allowed Britain to um, colonize areas in places like uh, Honduras. Moreover, Spanish maintained their control of Cuba until the end of the century, again breaking this Monroe Doctrine. I want to look finally at the relations with other powers specifically tensions with canada and relations with uh, latin america before we finish here so as an introduction the period of 1865 to 1890 saw the u.s consolidate its territory on the american continent and take an increasing interest in latin america and we go look at canada in 1867 the usa purchased alaska from russia uh, for the sum of 7.2 uh, million the main reason for this was to remove russian presence from the continent this is what was seen as the main reason for the purchase of alaska but even for people living at the time the purchase of alaska alaska was a very confusing decision Secretary of State Seward also had his own motivations for this purchase. So he believed that the ports in Alaska could open the way for trade with Northern Asia. And it could also be used to settle disputes with Canada. When it comes to Canada, Canada was effectively a British colony at this time. This made the Americans feel quite uneasy that there was a, a British colony um, right on the doorstep of the American nation. Thus, there were naturally going to be tensions between the USA and Canada. And after Seward bought Alaska, he expected the Canadian province of British Columbia to request annexation. However, many believe that this province should be annexed by the USA. However, this didn't happen. 
So there was also a Canadian migration southwards in the 1870s and the 1880s, when it seemed to be the case that the USA was developing at a much faster rate than, than Canada was. So you start to see the, the tensions with Canada tracing back to the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War, and the sort of annexation from from Britain. Since Canada was effectively a British colony, tensions were still high between the two nations. When it comes to relations with Latin America, um, it must be said that during this period, uh, the USA did seek to develop its influence in Latin America. And this led to what was known as the first Pan-American Conference in 1889. So the first Pan-American Con Conference in 1889, uh, delegates from 18 countries met in Washington in October 1889, and they had really two main objectives. They wanted a customs union offering free trade across the American continent, and they wanted a system of international arbitration to avoid future wars. However, these goals did seem to be a little a bit too ambitious. So as a result, nothing was really agreed beyond a few tree, trade agreements and a weak arbitration system, which was only really signed by half the delegates. So you can sort of see that, you know, this was the, the Pan American Conference. The first Pan American Conference wasn't at all a, a huge success. And also by the late 1880s, more Americans were supporting foreign involvement with the closure of the Western frontier and the development of the U.S. economy. So the sort of the, the memory of the Civil War started to fade as we're going into the 1900s. And along with also the closing of the Western frontier, um, a move away from isolationist foreign policy became, a, a, you know, became an important part of American culture. When it comes to the final thing we're going to talk about, the protection of trade, the growth and improvement of trade came with the growth in military protection. Despite this, however, though, by the 1880s, their army was limited to around 25,000 men. And naval secretaries, naval secretaries called for expansion of the service, but their efforts were rebutted until the following decade. So with all this being said, we have gone through and looked at a real uh they've just gone through an overview a sort of revision overview of the first chapter reconstruction and the era of the gilded age so you've got really a lot of things developing following the end of the civil war the era of reconstruction was ultimately a failure when when we when we look at it especially the idea of radical reconstruction and then we start to look at what the politics, the society, the economy and the foreign policy was like during the Gilded Age. The era of weak uh, presidents, the era of um, weak civil service reform and the era of uh, political corruption. When it came to economic developments, you see that there are a lot of um growth of corporations and growth of monopolies within america and this was only really sort of stymied by antitrust legislation following the end of laissez-faire government intervention finally you've got the closing of the frontier which really did um, provide quite a large cultural significance to the american people and this sort of developed and pushed into foreign policy objectives away from isolationism. So in the next video, we're going to have a look at the second chapter, which is the uh, populism, progressivism and imperialism chapter. So really carrying on the story from 1890 to 1920.